1971, Stephen Cook authored a seminal paper that laid the groundwork for a sacred question. If we can verify a solution to a problem efficiently, can we also find a solution to that problem efficiently? Or, in computer science parlance, does P equal NP? In this video, we will describe the class of NP-complete problems which play a key role in tackling the tantalizingly untackled question of whether P is equal to NP. We'll look at some of the history behind these problems, how complexity classes are defined, and a strategy for determining which kinds of problem are difficult to solve efficiently. In 1900, David Hilbert was invited to give a lecture in Paris. Following the advice of his friend, the mathematician Hermann Minkowski, he used the opportunity to set an agenda for the century ahead, describing 23 problems spanning many fields of mathematics and challenging his colleagues to get at it. Lurking at number 10 was the task of determining, in a general way, the solvability of a Diophantine equation. Diophantine equations, named for the Greek mathematician Diophantus of Alexandria, are polynomial equations with integer coefficients and integer solutions. Perhaps the best known example is x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n, the equation that underpins Fermat's last theorem. A key point here is that rather than finding the solution itself, Hilbert just wanted to determine solvability to come up with a process that would tell, in a finite number of operations, if a problem could be solved. In the two decades following Hilbert's lecture, there were many shake-ups in mathematics. Einstein laid the foundations for quantum mechanics in 1905, which later led to the uncertainty principle of Heisenberg. Bertrand Russell then raised a delicate issue that has come to be known as Russell's paradox, whether we can define sets that contain all sets that do not contain themselves. If you ask yourself, does such a set contain itself, then things get sticky pretty quickly. To get things back on solid ground, Hilbert set out on a quest to achieve the rigorous axiomatization of mathematics. Beginning with lectures that he gave in the early 1920s, he described an alternative version of the tenth problem from his 1900 lecture under the name Entscheidungsproblem. The task was now to find a decision procedure to determine the provability of any well-formed formula. Together with his assistant, Wilhelm Ackermann, in 1928, Hilbert published a book that advertised the Entscheidungsproblem to the research community. In Vienna, Hilbert and Ackermann's book had found an interested reader in Kurt Gödel. In 1931, Gödel stunned the mathematical world with a paper that had the catchy title On Formally Undecidable Propositions of Principia Mathematica Systems I, a work that introduced what has come to be known as Gödel's Incompleteness Theorem. This result had the striking implication that finding a consistency proof for arithmetic within the system itself is impossible. On learning the result, Hilbert reportedly exhibited the unusual response of becoming somewhat angry, but accepted the finding and ultimately built it into his program of work. Gödel's result meant that a general decision process for determining the truth of a well-formed formula was impossible. However, it left open the possibility of a decision process for deciding the provability of a formula. Sadly for Hilbert, this door too would shut. In 1934, Gödel gave a series of lectures on the topic of general recursive functions as a model of computation, an idea that he credited to Jacques Herbrand, a precocious young French mathematician who sadly lost his life in a climbing accident at the age of 23. Though Gödel viewed his work as a heuristic principle rather than a formal model for computation, this approach, coupled with his incompleteness theorem, implicitly ruled out the possibility of the decision process Hilbert wanted. In 1936, Alonzo Church and Alan Turing independently contributed formal proofs that showed that no general procedure could be found to decide if an arbitrary proposition is provable from the axioms of first-order logic. The paper from Turing, who was aged 23 at the time, provided several key results. First, a very simple formal model for mechanical computation that has come to be known as Turing machines. Second, proof that no Turing machine can solve the halting problem. That is to say, to decide whether a given arbitrary Turing machine will halt or run indefinitely. Third, his negative answer to the Entscheidung's problem. A proof that no Turing machine can decide the provability of an arbitrary proposition. Without diving too far into the technical weeds, we can see how this idea works intuitively with a program designed by Christopher Strachey. Suppose we have managed to build a magical function called halts that takes in any function f and returns true if f halts and returns false if f doesn't halt. Now, let's build a mischievous function called Turing Mischief. In the body of our function, 
We employ our halts function to check if Turing mischief halts, and if it does, we loop forever. The big question is now, does Turing mischief halt? Suppose the answer is yes, but then our if statement evaluates to true, so we will fall into an infinite loop, a contradiction. Our magic halts function lied to us, Turing mischief didn't halt at all. Suppose on the other hand that the answer to the question of whether Turing mischief halts is no, then our if statement evaluates to false, so Turing mischief does indeed halt. Another contradiction. The halts function was wrong again. Our only conclusion can be that the magic halts function simply cannot exist. In this video, we are going to focus on how efficiently we can solve different kinds of problems. However, it's useful to bear in mind that Turing's work on the halting problem demonstrated that some problems cannot be solved at all. What does it mean for an algorithm to solve a problem efficiently? We'll call an algorithm efficient if it is able to solve a problem in polynomial time. That is to say, its runtime complexity is big O of n to the k for some constant k and input size n. This way of characterizing efficiency, which is known as Cobham's thesis, was put forward by Alan Cobham in 1965. Algorithmic efficiency is typically studied in the context of decision problems. Problems whose output is a Boolean value, yes or no. Three particularly widely used classes of decision problems include P, the class of decision problems that can be solved in polynomial time, NP, the class of decision problems where, if the answer is yes, the proof of the answer can be checked in polynomial time, and CoNP, the class of decision problems where, if the answer is no, the proof of the answer can be checked in polynomial time. Here, it's worth noting that every decision problem in P is also a member of NP and CoNP. That's simply because if you can solve a problem in polynomial time, you can certainly check a proof in polynomial time by recomputing the answer from scratch. Lastly, to clear up some potential confusion, note that the name NP technically stands for non-deterministic polynomial time. That's because the class NP can also be equivalently defined as the set of problems that can be solved by a non-deterministic Turing machine in polynomial time. However, since this definition is less intuitive, we, and almost everyone else, stick to the definition of NP that focuses on checking the proof in polynomial time. In a seminal 1971 paper, Stephen Cook laid the groundwork for a question that has come to be accepted as perhaps the most important unsolved problem in theoretical computer science. Does P equal NP? Note that the actual P and NP terminology was introduced by Richard Karp a year after Cook's paper. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that the answer is no. Obviously, P does not equal NP. The difficulty in having much conviction in my answer is that no proof has ever been found that P does not equal NP. This is not for want of trying. It is listed among the seven clay Mathematical Institute's Millennium Prize problems, and many have taken up the challenge, perhaps enticed by the million dollar prize fund. However, not only has there been little progress, the limited progress that there has been has produced barrier results which in fact prove that some lines of attack are guaranteed to fail. As noted by Jeff Erickson, not only do we not know how to prove P does not equal MP, we can actually prove that we have no idea how to prove P does not equal MP. In a similar vein, we can't prove that NP does not equal CoNP. Still, it's useful to have in mind a mental model for what every reasonable human thinks the world looks like. We have problems in P. This set is contained within the set of problems in NP, and it is also contained within the set of problems of CoNP. As an interesting aside, Cook was denied tenure at Berkeley just one year before publishing one of the most important papers of all time. This led legendary computer scientist Richard Karp to comment that it is to our everlasting shame that we were unable to persuade the math department to give him tenure. Cook went on to win the Turing Award for his work, offering an interesting insight into the nature of the modern academic hiring system. It is, perhaps, one of the more regrettable judgments since the University of Basel turned down the professorship application of a 19-year-old by the name of Euler. We need a few more definitions. We define a problem to be NP-hard if finding a polynomial time algorithm for the problem implies a polynomial time algorithm for all problems in NP. We can think of NP-hard problems as problems that are at least as hard as every NP problem. We define a problem to be NP-complete if it is both in NP-hard and in NP. Intuitively, NP-complete problems are the hardest problems in NP. These definitions can be a little hard to visualise, so let's return to our picture of what every reasonable human thinks the world looks like. We can expand our colourful Venn diagram with a set of NP-hard problems. The overlap between NP hard problems and NP problems is the set of NP complete problems. 
As an algorithm designer, you may reasonably ask why is it useful to know that a problem is NP-complete. The reason is that if you can show this, then there is truly no dishonour in giving up on searching for a fast, exact solution to the problem, and you can instead focus on developing an approximation algorithm or some other line of attack. Now we know why it's useful to show problems are NP-complete, we can devise a strategy for achieving this. Our strategy requires three key ideas. First, we need a way to convert optimization problems, which are the form that many interesting problems take, to decision problems, where our complexity classes apply. Second, we introduce reductions, which let us convert one problem into another in such a way that allows us to show that if one problem is NP-complete, then so is the other. Finally, in order to make use of reductions, we need to find at least one problem which we know is NP-complete. That is to say, we need a first NP-complete problem. Let's start with the first concept in our strategy. As a reminder, the NP-complete definition that we introduced earlier applies to decision problems, i.e. those with yes or no answers. However, many of the problems that we care about solving are instead optimization problems that don't fit this format, such as find the shortest path on an undirected graph. Thankfully, we can often convert an optimization problem into a decision problem. For example, rather than finding the shortest path, which is an optimization problem, we can ask, given an undirected graph G, vertices S and T, and integer K, does there exist a path between S and T consisting of at most K edges? This is a decision problem. If we can show that the decision problem variant is difficult, we can often show that the optimization problem variant is difficult as well. We next turn to polynomial time reductions, the second part of our grand strategy. We'll refer to a specific configuration of a problem as an instance of that problem. Now, suppose that we can transform instance alpha of problem A into instance beta of problem B, such that the transformation procedure takes polynomial time and the answer for alpha is yes, if and only if the answer to beta is yes. This kind of transformation is known as a polynomial time reduction algorithm. It has the useful property of allowing us to decide A in polynomial time if we can decide B in polynomial time. Since this may not be obvious, let's visualize how it works. The claim is that we can construct a polynomial time algorithm to decide A that takes in an instance alpha of A and maps it to the appropriate yes or no answer. To achieve this, we first apply the polynomial time reduction algorithm, which converts instance alpha of A into an instance beta of B. Then, since we've assumed that there is a polynomial time algorithm to decide B, we can use this to compute whether the answer to alpha is yes or no. This construction is tremendously useful for NP-completeness. Suppose that we have some problem A that we know is NP-complete, and that we have been able to find a polynomial time reduction algorithm that maps instances of A to instances of B. Then we have also shown that B is NP-complete. This is a simple proof by contradiction. If B was not NP-complete, then we could decide A in polynomial time. We now come to the third part of our strategy. In order to use reduction to show that a problem is NP-complete, we need a first problem that we know is NP-complete to start from. Thankfully, in his 1971 work, Stephen Cook, who we met earlier, proved that the circuit satisfiability problem is NP-complete. At approximately the same time, the same result was also obtained independently by Leonid Levin, who was then a PhD student in Moscow. For their contributions, the result has come to be known as the Cook-Levin theorem, the circuit satisfiability problem takes as input a Boolean circuit of AND, OR, and NOT gates and asks the question, does there exist a set of Boolean inputs that causes the output of the circuit to be 1? Earlier, we mentioned that we consider polynomial time algorithms to be efficient, an idea that's known as Cobham's thesis. Let's look at a few pragmatic reasons why problems with polynomial time solutions are considered tractable. First, few practical problems with polynomial time algorithms have very high order. For example, big theta of n to the thousand. Though such complexities are possible, they are rarely encountered in practice. Second, once a first polynomial time algorithm is found, experience suggests that more efficient variants will often be found later. Third, polynomial time solvable problems in one model of computation have the useful property that they are often solvable in polynomial time in other models of computation. For example, the same problems are solvable in polynomial time on Turing machines and on serial RAM machines. 
Finally, the class of polynomial time solvable problems has several useful closure properties. In particular, since polynomials are closed under addition, multiplication and composition, we can feed one polynomial time algorithm into another to get a composite algorithm that's still polynomial time. To be precise in our descriptions, we need a few formal definitions. First, we define an abstract decision problem as a mapping from a set of problem instances, i, to the set containing 0 and 1. To give an example, suppose that i is the tuple consisting of a graph g, nodes s and t, and an integer k denoting the number of edges that collectively represent an instance of the abstract decision problem path which decides whether a path of less than or equal to k edges can be found in g. Then path i equals 1 if there exists a path in g from s to t with less than or equal to k edges, and path i equals 0 otherwise. Now, in order to solve an abstract decision problem instance, we need a way to communicate the instance to the computer. The way we do this is with an encoding, which is a mapping from abstract objects to binary strings. As an example, we can encode the set of natural numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. as binary strings in the familiar way 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, etc. Once we have chosen an encoding, we define the size of problem instance i to be the length of its encoded string, which we denote by the cardinality of i. We then say that a problem whose instance set is the set of binary strings is a concrete problem. We are now in a position to define the complexity class P a little more precisely than we did earlier. First, we'll say that an algorithm solves a concrete problem in Tn time if, given problem instance i of size n, the algorithm produces a solution in Tn time. We say that a concrete problem is polynomial time solvable if there exists an algorithm to solve it in big O of n to the k time for some constant k. We can then define the complexity class P as the set of concrete decision problems that are polynomial time solvable. One slightly subtle point to note here is that the choice of encoding affects the size of the problem instance. However, we can typically convert between sensible encodings in polynomial time provided we rule out particularly inefficient schemes like unary encoding. As a consequence, within reason, encoding choice tends not to affect whether a problem lies in P or not. Therefore, rather than identifying an encoding for each problem, we'll use angle brackets around an object O to denote a standard encoding of O. Here, a standard encoding is any sensible encoding that produces a code for an integer that is polynomially related to its binary representation and takes similarly sensible design choices for other objects. A discussion of decision problems can benefit from formal language theory, but it does require us to drink deeply from the well of definitions. Here goes. An alphabet, sigma, is a finite set of symbols. A language, L, over sigma, is any set of strings formed of symbols from sigma. For example, given sigma as the set containing 0 and 1, the set L equal to 10, 11, 101, 111, etc. is the language of prime numbers in binary. We use epsilon to denote the empty string and sigma star to denote the language of all strings over sigma. For example, given sigma as the set containing 0 and 1, sigma star is the set containing epsilon, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, etc. Standard set theoretic operations on languages such as union and intersection follow directly from the definitions above. The set of problem instances for decision problem Q is the language sigma star, where sigma is the set containing 0 and 1. In fact, since the decision problem Q is fully characterized by the set of problem instances that produce a yes answer, we can interpret Q as a language L over sigma where L consists of the members X of sigma star, for which Q of X equals 1. To try to make this a bit more concrete, we can revisit the decision problem for finding a path in an undirected graph with at most K edges. This has a corresponding language, which we'll also call path, consisting of the tuples containing the undirected graph G, source and target nodes S and T, and non-negative integer k, such that there exists a path from s to t in g with at most k edges. Note that this time, differently to the abstract decision problem we saw before, we have encoded the tuples as binary strings. A major benefit of introducing all this notation for formal languages is that they allow us to succinctly express the link between decision problems and the algorithms that solve them. Okay, let's bravely load up on a few more definitions. An algorithm A is said to accept a binary string x if, 
Given x as input, the output of a is 1. On the other hand, algorithm A is said to reject the binary string x if, given x as input, the output of A is 0. The language accepted by A is the set of binary strings accepted by A. An important point to note is that even if algorithm A accepts language L, we can't be sure that A rejects every binary string that is not in L. The algorithm may simply loop forever. We say that language L is decided by A if every binary string in L is accepted and every binary string not in L is rejected. We'll say that L is accepted in polynomial time by an algorithm A if L is accepted by A and there exists some constant k such that for any string x in L of length n, A accepts x in big O of n to the k time. We'll say that the language L is decided in polynomial time by A if there exists some constant k such that for any binary string of length n, the algorithm A decides x in big O of n to the k time. A key difference between these two is that to accept a language L, the algorithm A only needs to provide an answer for strings in L. To decide a language L, algorithm A must accept or reject every binary string. For Turing's halting problem we met earlier, an accepting algorithm exists, but no decision algorithm exists. Given the definitions above, we can define a complexity class as a set of languages whose membership is determined by a complexity measure, such as runtime, of an algorithm that decides the language. This enables an alternative definition of the complexity class P as the set of languages for which there exists an algorithm that decides the language in polynomial time. Before turning to the question of verification, we'll look at two decision problems that look similar on the surface. A Hamiltonian cycle of undirected graph G is a simple cycle containing every vertex in V. An Eulerian cycle of undirected graph G is a cycle containing every edge in E exactly once. Interestingly, both concepts arose in the context of puzzles. William Hamilton devised a children's game in which the task was to find a path around a dodecahedron that visited each vertex exactly once. Leonard Euler studied cycles in the context of the famed Seven Bridges of Königsberg problem, where the task was to determine whether it was possible to cross each bridge exactly once. The decision problems of determining whether G contains Hamiltonian or Eulerian cycles are defined by the following two languages. Ham cycle, the set of encoded graphs that contain a Hamiltonian cycle, and Euler cycle, the set of encoded graphs that contain an Eulerian cycle. We know from Euler's theorem that a connected graph contains an Eulerian cycle if and only if every vertex has even degree. Since we can check this property in polynomial time by simply visiting each node once, Euler cycle is a member of P. On the other hand, there is no known polynomial time algorithm that decides ham cycle, so ham cycle is not a member of P, at least as far as we know. However, if a helpful stranger was to provide us with a cycle that they claim is a Hamiltonian cycle, we could verify it in polynomial time by checking that the cycle is a valid permutation of the nodes and confirming that each proposed edge exists in E. More formally, we will define a verification algorithm A as an algorithm that takes two arguments, an input binary string x and a certificate binary string y. We say that algorithm A verifies string x if there exists a certificate y such that a of x y equals 1. We'll also say that the language verified by A is the set of binary strings x for which there exists a certificate y such that a of x y equals 1. In this terminology, the complexity class NP is the class of languages that can be verified by a polynomial time algorithm. More formally, language L is a member of NP if and only if there exists some polynomial time algorithm A and constant C such that L is equal to the set of strings x for which there exists some certificate y whose length is big O of the length of x to the c such that A of x y equals 1. Similarly, we can define the set of languages belonging to complexity class co-NP as those for which there exists some polynomial time algorithm A and constant C such that L is equal to the set of strings X for which there exists some certificate Y whose length is big O of the length of X to the C such that A of XY equals zero. Sadly, as we noted earlier, precious little has been proven about the relationships between P, NP and co-NP. One perennially useful strategy for solving a problem 
is to reduce or recast it to another problem that we do know how to solve. In the formal language decision problem framework, we say that L1 is polynomial time reducible to L2, denoted L1 less than or equal to subscript P L2. If there exists a polynomial time computable function f mapping binary strings to binary strings, such that for every binary string x, x is in L1 if and only if f of x is in L2. This can be a little easier to understand visually. Suppose we have a language L1 occupying some subset of the space of strings and a language L2 that occupies some other subset of the space of strings. Then f reduces L1 to L2 if it maps every point in L1 to a point in L2 and every point that is not in L1 to a point that is not in L2. This construction immediately leads us to the following useful lemma. If L1 and L2 are languages such that L1 is polynomial time reducible to L2, then if L2 is in P, L1 is also in P. To prove this statement, we first construct a polynomial time function to compute f of x for any input string x. Then we use A2 to denote a polynomial time algorithm that decides L2, which we know we can find since L2 is in P. We can then simply compose A2 and F together to create a new composite algorithm that decides L1 in polynomial time. We now have everything we need to characterize NP completeness in detail. We say that a language L over the space of binary strings is NP hard if L dash is polynomial time reducible to L for every L dash in NP. We say that a language L over the space of binary strings is NP complete if both 1, L is in NP, and 2. L dash is polynomial time reducible to L for every L dash in NP. We write NPC to denote the complexity class of NP complete languages. It's worth asking, why is NP completeness so critical to the study of whether P equals NP? One key reason is the following theorem, which states that if any NP complete problem is polynomial time solvable, then P equals NP. For the proof, suppose that L is in P, and L is also in NPC. By the definition given above, we know that L dash is polynomial time reducible to L for any L dash in NP, so L dash is in P. That is to say, every NP language is also NP, and so P equals NP. This is why NP complete problems receive a lot of attention in the theoretical computer science literature. In the video description, you can find links to slides and references. I hope you have a wonderful day.